What is unique about the United States as a hegemonic power is that we voluntarily limit our freedom of action in order to get others to voluntarily follow a set of rules that we think are mutually beneficial. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Welcome to a podcast that searches for the ideas, policies, and strategies that can be to for a time populists like Donald Trump over the next four years and the next 40. I am a skeptic about a lot of media criticism. If you think that the New York Times is the voice of white supremacy, I don't know what words you have left to describe Donald Trump or Stephen Miller. So I don't like bashing the media. I'm very careful in choosing my words. And yet I have to say that an article published recently in the Times of London left me flabbergasted. On Twitter it teased, Trump, Putin, Erdogan and Duterte are unpalatable demagogues in many ways, but at least they get things done, writes Claire Fogies. And in fact, that really is what she argued. Filled with random broadside against Barack Obama, she ultimately says, people like Trump and Erdogan don't just mouth, yes we can, they prove it. We could do with more of that ambition here. It is the old bromide that Mussolini and Hitler at least make the trains run on time. No little bit more intellectually sophisticated than that. And it does once again drive home to me how deeply some of our elites, not just in politics, but also in the media, also in business, are still failing in understanding the stakes of this situation. There's just no excuse for publishing this kind of dross. Shame on you, Times of London. But now it's a real treat that Corey Schacke is joining us on the podcast. Corey, and this is a bit of a mouthful, is currently the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. She was at Stanford's Hoover Institution before. She was the Deputy Director of Policy Planning at the State Department in the late 2000s. And she is the co-editor with one, wait for it, Jim Mattis, of a book called Warriors and Citizens, American Views of Our Military. So there could be few people better placed than Corey to make sense for us of the damage that Trump is doing to transatlantic relations and why it is that we should care about transatlantic relations in the first place. Why it is that we should care about things like NATO at all. We had a great wide-ranging discussion trying to make sense of some of these things and I hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the podcast, Corey. It is a great joy to be with you, my friend. So listen, we are recording this in the middle of a NATO summit. The episode is not going to air for a few weeks. So, you know, by the time that all of you hear this, everything may have changed. And we're not going to go into... The liberal order may have been collapsed. <sighs> it may have been. I mean, just this morning, Donald Trump was castigating Germany over breakfast and immediately posting the video of it on Twitter. But I want to get away from the details of this and pull back a little bit in order to understand what the transatlantic alliance has actually done for the world, and in particular for liberal democracies, how threatened it is, and what we can do to restore it, and what the implications of the current crisis are. So how do you see the role of that alliance? I think it's easy for us to sort of be shocked and flabbergasted by what Trump is doing, but I feel like sometimes we don't actually think carefully enough about why it's necessary and what the role is. So what has the transatlantic relationship been what have organizations like NATO accomplished and, and why is it that we even need them? So I love that framing of the conversation. The one thing I will say in President Trump's defense is that his political genius is asking first order questions that people like you and me haven't conveyed accessible enough answers to the broad general public often enough in recent years, mm. right? Because the president's yeah. not wrong that it seems crazy that Germany spends less than 2% of its gross domestic product to defend its country. And 
castigates us for our choices about defense spending versus social welfare spending, and then expects us to protect them. Well, I would even go a step further, having grown up in Germany. I think there's an incredible amount of cultural snobbism that comes with that. You know, essentially in the post-war period, Germany didn't have to look after its own defense. It had to do some of it, but mostly it was outsourced to the United States. And then it looked at America's actions around the world, which no doubt sometimes involved mistakes, and said, oh, you militaristic Americans, you know, we are the cultured Europeans who don't worry about things like the army. We have a nice postmodern state where we just negotiate and trade with people. But look, you brute Americans who are all into your guns and into your weapons and into your military. And there is something hypocritical about that. There's certainly something condescending about it. And I think that's part of why the president's outrage about this gets traction. Mm -hmm. He's not the first American president to be frustrated that Europeans don't spend more on their own defense, don't have closer to a common approach to engaging security problems in Europe and beyond Europe with the United States, and that Europeans rely on us for their existential safety and yet never seem to tire of telling us all of our faults. Hmm. All of those things are true, but the fundamental point, the bedrock of the transatlantic relationship is that the United States is more capable of protecting and advancing its interests in the world with the help of countries that share our values and the center of gravity of those countries is in Europe. Let me push you on that, because as you say, I think what Donald Trump is brilliant at is to try to unravel what John Stuart Mill would have called sort of areas of dead agreement, right? Areas where we believe something because we've been told to believe it, and our parents believed it, and our grandparents believed it. It may really be right, but we actually need somebody to make the case against it in order to remember why it is valid. Now, I do still believe these things, but let's make sure that we actually pull each of these things out. So why is it that America needs to have allies that actually share its values? Why is it that America needs allies at all? And why is it that the allies it should look for are the ones who actually share those values? So my answer to those two questions is the same, both why does America need allies and why do the values matter? If you look at the long sweep of the last 200 years of American foreign policy, the most reliable indicator of what will interest Americans in engaging with the rest of the world is actually sentimentality. It's not hard-edged American national interests. Mm. And so values matter because shaping the world in our interest is something that Americans actually viscerally understand is good for us that the world feels less dangerous when it's populated by democracies. And the political science research backs that up. Democracies fight a lot in the international order, but they don't fight each other. Mm -hmm. so there are two different questions here, right? And one is that it seems to me Donald Trump actually doesn't believe that there's such a thing as positive sum cooperation. So the problem with America first, in my mind, is not that Donald Trump wants to look out for American interests. I think Barack Obama did that, and George W. Bush did that, every American president has done that. They all thought, you know what, there's plenty and plenty of deals that, say, Germany and the United States can do together, in which they were better off after. Whereas but, Donald Trump has a zero-sum thing, yeah. where, you know, in order for me to have a gain, you have to have a loss. Right. Um, so that's one problem, right? And then the other problem is, well, even in so far as you agree that we have to have allies or we have to have treaties, should we be giving priority to agreements to treatises with countries that have similar ways of organizing themselves domestically? Or is it just as fine to cut a deal with North Korea and China and Russia and there's no real difference? So ask yourself why the American public has for 70 years been comfortable threatening a nuclear war in order to protect Europe, but 
when Hillary Clinton tried to suggest as Secretary of State that the U.S. would extend the nuclear umbrella to Saudi Arabia, she was laughed off the stage. Hmm. Right? Well, I'm so, that, I agree that there is this it's sentiment, a, and I share it. It is about committing the American public to care about the rest of the world. Hmm. Um, we fundamentally, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident and believe that people have rights and they loan them in limited ways to governments for agreed purposes. Hmm. The countries that have that same political compact, we get tired of, we're exasperated with, they meddle in our business all the time and judge us. And yet, those are the countries that we care about what happens to them consistently over time. And they are the countries that are the most help to us in the world in advancing our interests. So I would say three kind of quick things. The first is that Americans prefer to play team sports. We will act unilaterally in the world if we need to. We don't like to. It makes us feel more confident we're right when others will join us, especially when those others are societies where people hold their governments accountable. That feels like safe space to us. The second thing I would say is that America's allies are tiresome. Europeans don't do enough for themselves. They they never miss an opportunity to point out our shortcomings. We would trade Europe in for better allies if we could, <laughs> right? The problem is there aren't better allies to be had, which takes me to my third point. If you think the United States is better off without a close transatlantic bond, try and get anything done in the world otherwise, even without Europeans working against us, right? Just European passivity. Everything else is harder because of the fundamental values that we share, because we share the belief that positive sum outcomes are in everybody's interest and the negotiation to find the trade space, as tiring as it can be, it also shapes all of our attitudes going forward. It commits us to peaceful resolution of disputes. It commits us to respecting each other's fundamental interests. It teaches us a common language by which we talk about things. All of these things contribute to cooperative security and to productive problem solving. The cooperation we have with our European allies drives down the cost to the United States of everything it does in the world because Europeans are major cultural and values voices because they are major contributors to important institutions that we like to work through to get things done, because they are the world's most reliably prosperous countries. Mm -hmm. And so when we want material help, that material help is most often forthcoming from Europeans. And it's never as much as we want it, and it's never as easy as it should be. And yet, if anybody can find a better deal, I'll gladly take it. But (laughs) I've been looking for a better deal since 1990. And what keeps dragging Americans, even who don't come out of a transatlantic history, what drags us all towards transatlantic cooperation is these are the most capable countries most likely to share our views, and most likely to shoulder some of the burden for fixing problems we're worried about. So I'm trying to think, and I have to admit it's not a pleasant thought, uh, what Donald Trump would say if he were sitting at this lovely table with us. And I guess sort of his response, slightly idealized, would be something like, well, look, yeah, if you want to go and do all of those things in the world, you probably need Europe. That's probably true. But why should we be doing these things in the world in the first place? Why should we be engaged in the world? And once you think that we don't need to be engaged in the world, it's true that the United States, both through its nuclear arsenal and its conventional weapons, has more than enough power on its own to defend itself. Mexico is not going to invade the United States. Canada is not going to invade the United States. We can defend ourselves in a nuclear war. Why is it that the United States actually needs to go out and do those things? It's a fabulous question. It's a really important question for us all to answer. The United States is 5% of the world's population, 20% of the world's GDP. We are fundamentally connected to the world 
by the needs of our own prosperity. So at its most basic level, the United States is a global power because that is the key to our prosperity. The second argument I would make to President Trump and to my mom and everybody else (laughs) and all of the listeners of your podcast is that the people who built the liberal international order that comes out of the ashes of World War II, you know, it wasn't starry-eyed leftists sitting around faculty lounges. It was the men who had fought Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. And for those men, the winning of that war was a very close-run thing and knee-bucklingly costly to Western societies. What they were trying to do was create an insurance policy that would help us get cooperative solutions to problems as they exist, to increase everybody's prosperity, because as Shakespeare said, it's the lean, hungry men you need to worry about, and to get the strongest powers in the international order roped into a set of processes, institutions, and agreed rules that made behavior predictable, that that's how you beat back the rising tides of nationalism. That's how you have early warning signs when danger is gathering. That's how you prevent one country from destabilizing the continent of Europe or Asia by playing team sports together. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a leftist ideology that it was people saying, We just had to have 10 million Americans under arms. We had to spend 40% of our GDP on the war effort. And we and everybody else who fought that war took enormous numbers of casualties with huge human tragedies associated with them. Isn't there a better way to do this? And the better way they came up with was a series of security commitments between the United States and the countries that share our values that gave weaker countries a say over what the rules are and a vote over American behavior so that they felt represented in the system. That what is unique about the United States as a hegemonic power is that we voluntarily limit our freedom of action in order to get others to voluntarily follow a set of rules that we think are mutually beneficial. That sounded very convincing to me. So how much danger is this order in now? Do you think that we should think of this moment as Donald Trump having a strange obsession which will last as long as the presidency does and after that everything will go back to being fine? That's one extreme view. Or do you think of the other extreme that essentially the will of the American public to actually spend resources and have it for for balance in order to provide security guarantees to Europe has run thin. Europe doesn't look like it's willing to increase its defense spending and stop being condescending towards Americans. And because of those two kinds of developments, the transatlantic relationship will continue to fracture in the coming decades. Is it it one extreme, the other extreme, or more likely somewhere in between? I like the somewhere in between answer, but I'm closer to the first than the second, namely that I think the liberal order is extraordinarily robust. And I like it that we're worried that it's coming unraveled or collapsing around our ears because that kind of paranoia mobilizes us, as your work illustrates so beautifully, mobilizes us to think carefully about That's choices. That's the light way in which my work has ever been called paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shockey's theory of strategy is that every good strategist is a desperate paranoiac, right? Because to be a good strategist, you always have to worry about, have I made the right assumptions? Are things playing out along with my expectations? If a trap door opens underneath me that's going to drop me into the sewer below, what am I going to do when that happens? And I want four backup plans. And that, by the way, is actually a good way of summarizing part of the spirit of my work, which is to say that, you know, I started 
writing about these issues at a time when there was incredible complacency about the stability of liberal democracies, in which the utter consensus in political science was there will never be any more. And I try, as, as my friend Lee Druckmann put it, pointing out, look, we have this huge lump that's growing. And perhaps it's not cancer, but we better watch it really closely and get it checked out. Exactly. Um, and the counter arguments to me often strike me as, well, you know, more likely than not, this is not going to kill us. And, and perhaps it's right, right? I mean, I'm not saying that liberal democracy is sure <laughs> to collapse. Certainly not. But we need to take the dangers seriously and watch them closely. Absolutely. One of my favorite articles ever written about American foreign policy was written by the journalist James Fallows mm -hmm. in The Atlantic when he returned to the United States after having been the correspondent in Beijing. And when he got back to America, it was in the welter of a rising China is going to become the new hegemon of the international order. And what James Fallows wrote is that the role of the Jeremiah in American foreign policy mm. of always thinking we're failing is integral to our success because we do worry we're not good at things. We do worry we're being supplanted. And that's how you motivate a free society to focus on a problem and to come up with a range of fixes. So, you know, I'm the unashamed possessor of the tiara of optimism. <laughs> As you'll remember from our Intelligence Square debate, but I do genuinely believe it's true that patterns of cooperation are very sticky. The first American president to think that NATO was collapsing was Dwight Eisenhower. In 1956, they have a National Security Council staff meeting at which John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, and President Eisenhower lament that the NATO idea has run its course. And Europeans do not understand the dangers. They are unwilling to face those dangers. It is high time the United States finds a better solution. So since you've beautifully made the case for pessimism, let me indulge my hobby. Um, <laughs> because there is one crucial difference between the example you just gave and what's going on now, which is that you said President Eisenhower was lamenting that he thought the idea of NATO may have run its course, whereas it's quite clear that President Trump is celebrating that. That he yes, but has remember called NATO obsolete <laughs> in all kinds of situations. That he has reportedly, and I can't say this with quite the clarity with which I've been told it, has mistaken the identity of somebody he spoke to at a recent summit and told him that he wants to destroy four institutions, NAFTA, the WTO, the EU, and NATO. So that's a very different stance. We're at a point at which the American mm -hmm. president isn't concerned about the underlying trend that may make NATO obsolete, but may make NATO uh, less stable. We are facing a president who, in my interpretation, doesn't see the point of NATO, doesn't see the point of any deep security or certainly values relationship with other countries, and actually would quite like to destroy it. I agree with your assessment of President Trump. I think he fundamentally does not believe in the bedrocks of liberal internationalism. He believes allies are a burden, not a benefit to us. He believes that trade is bad for the United States. He believes that we're being taken advantage of right and left and somehow been powerless to shape events. And he's wrong on all of those counts. But I take your point that he is a uniquely destructive force because he doesn't believe in the bedrock principles that shared prosperity and shared security are not only good for everybody, but they're especially good for the United States mm. because we are the most internationally connected country by virtue of our economy, by virtue of our society. I also take your point that President Trump is reflecting a broader American exasperation. You're an American politics expert. I'm not, but I sailed on the. I will. Uh, I sailed. Protest <laughs> what you say, but you move on. <laughs> I sailed on the pirate ship McCain in 2008. I was a senior foreign policy advisor on John's presidential campaign, and my experience of American politics is that they're pendular at the federal level. 
We always choose a president who fixes what we didn't like about the previous president and underestimate how much we are not going to like the characteristics about that person that we vote for. And I think September 11th and the Iraq war are enormous milestones in thinking about America and the world. The sense of vulnerability that comes from September 11th and the mistakes of the Iraq war, right? It sharpens everything else. Those two issues, they changed the direction the United States was going in really important ways mm -hmm. and changed, put an enormous amount of stress on its other relations. My observation of what it does for security policy in American political context is people are scared about the world, want it to go away, and feel like we are disproportionately bearing the burden of addressing risks that everybody's suffering from. So I went to work in the Bush White House after September 11th. I hadn't worked on the campaign. I was part of the original team. And what shocked me so much was how scared everybody was, mm -hmm. how much the president and the secretary of state and the national security advisor believed they let the country down, that they had not been careful enough in protecting the American public. And it changed the risk tolerance mm -hmm. of the administration in a way that caused us to be much more assertive and assertive with the hard use of military force as played out in Iraq. My sense is that if even two years later, the sanctions regime was eroding in Iraq the way it was eroding in 2003, and Saddam Hussein's behavior towards the UN weapons inspectors had been as egregious, I think the United States would not have gone to war in Iraq. It was a choice of a particular moment in time. And I think it will cast a shadow as long as the Vietnam War cast in American attitudes about security policy. What I think Trump has tapped into is a sense of fragility by the United States that we doubt we can affect the security problems going on out in the world. How long have we been fighting in Afghanistan and in Iraq? Yeah. And it feels lonely. It doesn't feel like others are stepping forward to solve problems. That's, I think, unfair, but that's what my mom feels. Right, right. And third, that the world feels very complicated and people don't understand what's happening. On that latter part, that is the failure of politicians, hmm. right? So Barack Obama can lament all he wants, Donald Trump's wrecking ball to the international trading order, but Barack Obama campaigned in 2008 on destroying NAFTA. Mm. So there's been a lot of recklessness on the part of all of our top class of politicians in not explaining the world to Americans. We are not going to get back to a sort of steady American foreign policy until we have a conversation as a country, as a political community, about the basics, about if you're scared about the world, being alone makes it a lot scarier. At Qualcomm, we believe in staying connected, and you can see us wherever 5G is helping transform telemedicine, supporting remote education, and powering mobile PCs. The Invention Age is here. Learn more at qualcomm.com slash invention age. I take all of that. To me, it still seems as though 2020 in this respect, as in so many other respects, is actually crucial. That when I speak to senior foreign policymakers in continental Europe, a year ago, they sort of thought, well, Trump is going to moderate, and in the end, these things are so hard wired they're not going to matter. Now they're deeply scared, deeply scared by mm -hmm. his willingness to call the American security commitment to Europe and doubt. At the same time, those are political cultures which respond very slowly, very cautiously. The basic qualification for becoming a senior German politician for 50 or 60 years has been not really to have any original ideas. So <laughs> now that they're faced with a very different situation, it's hard for them to develop new strategies. So it'll take a long time. And we see with military spending, where actually I agree with you, Germany should spend more 
both to a smart time and address some of the long-standing inequity in, in defense spending and, frankly, in order to have a little bit more autonomy from the United States because it can't rely on the United States to the same extent. So it's a good double strategy. At the same time, you know, I, I do wonder what would happen if Trump gets re-elected in 2020. And I wonder what would happen, for example, if he pulled troops out of Germany, if he pulled mm-hmm. troops out of Europe. I've had a conversation with a very senior German foreign policy maker who comes very much from the political left, who fought through the consequences of that and essentially said, if Americans pull out the soldiers, then it calls the American nuclear guarantee into doubt. France would be forthcoming, but it's unclear that the nuclear arsenal is big enough that we can rely on that. So we're going to have a conversation about developing a nuclear bomb in Germany. So I do wonder, first of all, in terms of security terms, how big the long-term consequences of Trump's rhetoric and actions are going to be, especially if he gets re-elected. I agree with you that 2020 is an important threshold because Trump being elected once, the Europeans could mollify themselves that it was a particular crazy moment in time. There are not entry requirements for becoming president of the United States beyond being 35 years old and born in the country. So it's always scary to America's friends that any lunatic can get elected (laughs) president of the United States and Americans actually like it that way. We like the responsiveness of our political system. But it's scary, especially for countries whose risk tolerance isn't as freewheeling as America's risk tolerance is. I also think it's true that despite numerous consequential policy choices the Trump administration has made, willingness to station troops in Poland, the European Reassurance Initiative, They've made a whole series of decisions to reassure Europeans about American Mm -hmm. commitment. And I agree with your conclusion that none of it matters because the fundamental risk in the system is the president being unwilling to honor America's treaty commitments. I would be extremely nervous. I'm skeptical that the outcome is, especially in the near term, is a Germany bristling with military might and going nuclear. I think the greater likelihood is a likelihood of passivity, of making compromises with aggressive powers rather than throwing their shoulders back and defending their interests. So, so this is the flip side, actually, right? So I mean, essentially... I think that's what it, European well, hedging looks like. Yes. Once Europe no longer knows whether its security is guaranteed by America, I think actually on a more positive road, I don't favor Germany getting a nuclear bomb, but on a more positive road, Europe actually says, all right, so we need to become a little bit more strategically independent, and that means that we need to invest more in the military, and paradoxically, that would also strengthen the transatlantic relationship. So that's why I called it a double strategy. Hmm. In both maximizes the chances of preserving the transatlantic relationship and gives Europe some autonomy to defend its liberal democracies and stand up for liberal democratic values if the United States continues to go in a deeply populist direction. So that's why, from a European perspective, I think that makes sense. The more likely outcome in many ways seems to be that European voters don't have much appetite for spending more on the military, which is understandable. They don't like the idea of having to look after their own security again and because they haven't had it for 60 or 70 years, essentially. And so then they might say, and some public opinion polls already go in that direction, eh, there's problems with the States, there's problems with Russia, there's problems with China. Let's just basically be neutral and trade them all. What do you think that would do both to the international order, to what the world looks like? And what do you think that would do domestically to Italy and to France and to Germany over time? That's a wonderful series of questions. I think internationally, it'll start to feel like the 1930s. Well, that's a reassuring, optimistic answer, Corey. We may look back at this time and call it the inner war years. Mm -hmm. Democracies are slow to organize because that's the nature of free societies. But... Europe has lost sight of its own strength. Let me just give you my favorite example, which is Iran. Britain, Germany, and France 
three of the parties to the Iranian nuclear agreement that the United States is now in violation of. Any one of those three countries could win a war against Iran. Mm. Not one of those three countries, not even cumulatively, would imagine going to war with Iran. And I think that's, for me, the data that shows that you're right. What hedging against the loss of American security guarantees will look like is a more timid Europe, a Europe that allows China to buy companies that steal intellectual property, help it move up the value chain to displace German firms and their excellence in engineering, that then demand preferential market access that European countries compromise to give. Mm -hmm. That puts China in an even stronger position that then begins to dictate the foreign policies and eventually to express views about the domestic policies of those countries. So that's a terrible international order, not just for Europe, but also for the United States. The most reliable way to predict the behavior of strong powers is to look at their domestic political order because they recreate the international order as a macrocosm of it. Mm. That's what Britain did. It's what the United States does. It's what China is trying to do. And it's what Russia is trying to do on its periphery, which is as far as its power can extend. So there's two aspects of this I want to draw out. I mean, the first is that, you know, at best, a world in which the United States is increasingly isolationist and Europe basically goes for some form of quasi-neutrality between the United States and the rising proton powers in the East is a world in which spheres of influence decide the fate of nations. And so any democratic aspirations in countries like Ukraine and perhaps countries to the west of Ukraine are going to be crushed in which China is able to exert hegemony in big parts of Asia, potentially calling into question the post-war order in deep ways and threatening the political independence of countries that border it in ways that it doesn't currently do. That seems to me like the best case scenario. But there's a deeper question here, right? Which is that, as you say, foreign policy and domestic politics is pretty intertwined. And we've already seen Russia's ability to influence elections, not just in the United States, but in Italy and Germany and France and all kinds of ways. I wonder what the domestic political consequences in the long run would be if the Italian public, the German public, the Belgian public knows that the very security depends on being acceptable to both the United States and Russia and China. Right. And I honestly have trouble thinking through this because on the one hand, I think, well, in some ways that's already the case. In some ways, Russia can already turn off the gas and a bunch of German pensioners die of cold at the end of the winter and hasn't made Germany a less liberal country in which you can say what you want and, you know, which has a strong preference for, for democratic rule. On the other hand, I can look at the history and say, well, Germany became that country because it was occupied and for a long time militarily dependent on the United States. And that certainly is uh, in both direct and indirect ways. One of the things that shaped German society as it is. And if suddenly Germans become deeply aware of actually being dependent on Russia and China, perhaps it would actually reshape the country. I, I'm really torn between those two views. Well, what do you think? Uh, I'm inclined towards the more pessimistic one, Yasha. We have to change the I, too, am deeply worried. And I'm not just worried about Europe. I'm worried about my own country. If you look at the way attitudes about Russia are changing, mm. uh, especially among conservatives, because of the president's nonstop tirades against our actual friends and exculpatory sermons about our adversaries, Public attitudes do change. And in the United States, they change more quickly in other places. It is easily possible for governments to use the tools of free societies to our advantage. If you look at the terrific work that the government of Australia is doing to expose Chinese government actions to corrupt politicians, mm. to try and intimidate students on college campuses, mm 
to try and intimidate journalists. We in the West are right now very concerned about the vulnerabilities posed by free societies and the way that our adversaries can reach in and manipulate them. But we forget that there are also enormous strengths of free societies. And in fact, the authoritarians should be afraid of us because what is brilliant and beautiful about free societies is you always have to win the argument. Mm -hmm. And when you win the argument, that's what makes democratic societies more durable allies to each other because you have to win the public argument. Our governments are so much more resilient than authoritarian governments because they have to win every news cycle, or not every news cycle, but enough of them that they can get reelected. Mm -hmm. So they're better at handling adversity than unfree societies. And exposure is the real tool of free societies. And we shouldn't just lament that that is being used against us for our failings, but we ought to up our game and force the countries we are afraid of having influence in our societies to have to compete at that level too. Hmm. So I, I want to end the conversation by focusing a little bit on what to do about all of this. There's two kinds of buckets. First is policy. What do you think American policy should be? What do you think European countries should be doing in order to both preserve native and transatlantic relationship and make themselves less vulnerable to authoritarian powers influencing them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second bucket is personal action. Is there anything that listens to this podcast can actually do? Or is this a sphere that's so far removed from the daily life that, you know, beyond going out and campaigning and the midterms in 2020 and those kinds of things, there's really nothing they can do? So here I am wildly optimistic <laughs> uh, because the great blessing of free societies is the vibrancy of our civil society. So part of the reason American politics is in such a parlous state at the moment is our passivity. Right? And even now, even the people who are fearful about the direction Trump is taking the country, first of all, Democrats need to get organized and stop being a loose collection of interest groups and act like an organized political party. <laughs> But second of all, you know, the globalization, the way the information revolution is changing societies, we're very fearful of the way authoritarians are capitalizing on that. But the long-term advantages are actually to free societies, right? Because all of us carry a supercomputer in our pocket with a video camera that can bear testimony to government action. You know, a woman with an internet connection sitting in New Hampshire started a global campaign to ban landmines, mm -hmm. which almost every government other than ours has signed up for. And parenthetically, for allied defense, it's a good thing we didn't. But the civil society action, everybody ought to register and vote that we shouldn't be content to complain about our government if we haven't ardently, actively participated in shaping it. Second thing is that there is no substitute for an informed populace, right? People shouldn't take my word for it that Germany's worth having as an ally. People ought to think their way through. Are you going to feel more comfortable, safer, stronger fighting in Afghanistan without German help? Are you going to feel as confident your government knows what it's doing? Are you going to feel as confident this is a burden we can sustain another 20 years? The other thing is there are so many ways to affect American government policy. You can hit bank shots in so many ways because our yeah. system is so porous. It's so open to influence. You know, the joke that everybody should be on Fox News right now because that's how you shape what the president thinks because he doesn't read anything and he doesn't listen to anybody, but he watches TV all day. More importantly, in addition to the sphere of individual action, of voting, of mobilizing others to vote, of debating these important issues, of stopping waiting for somebody on a white horse to solve this problem for us, but to roll our sleeves up and understand we are the solution to the problem. 
middle powered states have so much more power than they are giving themselves credit for. Mm. If you look at the way that Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Australia are sustaining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even when the American government is trying to collapse it. The United States is a big bull in a China shop, but careful shopkeepers also matter in China shops. If you look at the strategy, the French president appears. And I'm looking at this picture. So the United States is the bull and Germany and France are the shopkeepers who are sort exactly. of like, no, no, not this China. Not this. Exactly. Wait. Hold a red cape over the door or something. <laughs> <laughs> but Canadian prime I minister... Shop people, the shopkeepers are Spanish in that case. <laughs> there we go. Gains from trade, my friends. <laughs> it looks to me like Europeans in particular are missing the big opportunity of working around the American government. You know, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, announced a couple of weeks ago that the first country that's going to meet its Paris Climate Accord standards is actually the United States. Mm. Despite withdrawing from the accords and despite the overt hostility of the federal government. That's a good trolling announcement, by the way. My great home state of California and the city of Chicago and Michael Bloomberg and Apple Computers are going to drag the United States across the finish line mm. before anybody else. Mm. That's what's great about free societies. There are lots of ways to get things done. And the limited power of the federal government means if we care about something, get ourselves organized, figure out what are the levers we can push, show up at an Apple board meeting and ask them why they're not doing what you think is important to be done. You can shape the debate and affect policy even in the face of overt hostility. The Canadians are brilliant at doing this because they know the United States so intimately. Germany ought to be brilliant at this. You, they're a federal country. It should naturally be their game. And they know how to do it because I remember being lobbied by Rhineland Palatinate when the United States was thinking about reducing our airbase presence hmm. there. So Germans know how to do this. Europeans know how to do this. We all just need to push past federal government in the time of Donald Trump and push towards areas of social, civic, business, and sub-federal power to get the job done. Well, there is a wonderful, inspiring end to this conversation. Thank you so much, Roy Shaka. Thank you so much for having me. I'm such a fan of your work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying this podcast, please be like them. Rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter, put a prominent all caps ad for The Good Fight in your holiday away message. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to thegoodfight at newamerica.org. Thank you for listening to this podcast from New America. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. To learn more about New America, please visit newamerica.org.